بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين راسيا ما بقية الله في الأرضين عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعظان وأنصاره اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الماء وأكرمني بنور الفاء اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علمك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين We continue our discussion about akhlaq or ethics. There are four types of relations that should be studied in akhlaq. As I said, this is one way because some people divide it into two. They say personal ethics and interpersonal ethics. Something about yourself, something about yourself and other people. Some people say three. Something about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about yourself, about other people. But uh, maybe this is better to say four. So in the paper that you are given, Moral System of Islam, which is published in the volume on ethics from Islamic reference series. We publish a series of books under the title of Islamic reference series. Alhamdulillah, so far six volumes have been published. One is God, Existence and Attributes. The second is uh, Apostle of God. Sorry, second is Word of God. Third is Apostle of God. Fourth is a spiritual message of Islam, fifth is life, sixth is ethics. Inshallah, seven and eight are coming. One is about human beings, the other is about resurrection. So in the volume on ethics, I have this paper that you have it. So if you look at page one, you see moral teachings of Islam can be classified as follows. Instruction about one's relationship with God, Instructions about one's relationship with oneself. Instructions about one's relationship with other people. Either general or with some a specific group of people. For example, with your family, with your relatives, with your friends, with your neighbors, with strangers, with clients, with teachers, with students, fellow human beings. Four, instructions about one's relationship with the environment, including animals, plants, air, water, other living and non-living beings. So we start with the first one, page two, relationship with God. One of the things that should be governing our relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is dhikr, remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you look at the Qur'an, you find that according to Qur'an, remembrance of Allah is very fundamental. It's not just invocating some names of God. Remembrance of Allah is not to say la ilaha illallah, subhanallah, alhamdulillah. Remembrance of Allah is much more than that. Uh, I don't have time to explain this in some other places we explain this but very briefly according to the Quran everything good that you do that's a kind of remembrance of Allah your Iman is even remembrance of Allah why? Allah says in the Quran, "Afaman sharaha Allah sadrahu lil Islam, fahuwa ala nurin min Rabbihi, fawailun lil qasiyat qulubhum, 
من ذكر الله Allah gives you a contrast a comparison between two groups of people the people who have light because their heart is opened up afaman sharahallahu sadrahu lil islam the people that Allah has opened up their breast for islam therefore they have light fa huwa ala nur min rabb they have light from the lord this is one group the other group Allah says fawailun lil qasiyati qulubuhum min dhikr Allah the people whose hearts are hard they cannot remember Allah so this shows that islam is remembrance of Allah salat is remembrance of Allah aqim as-salata li dhikri establish prayer for my remembrance ان الصلاه تنهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله اكبر صلاه prohibits doing bad and ugly actions and remembrance of Allah is greater so the greater achievement of a person who prays is remembrance of Allah so therefore we can say remembrance of Allah or dhikr is to turn towards God to turn not only with your body but mostly with your mind and heart towards god to open yourself up expose your heart to the light coming from god you know if there is a source of light you know sun shining for example how can you get light from sun If you turn your back to sun you cannot get light if you put barriers between you and sun you cannot get light you have to turn towards light to our sun and make sure there is no barrier this is the when you turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and open up yourself and let the light reaches your heart this is the and therefore We say in du'a kumail Allahumma inni ataqarrabu ilayka bi dhikri I seek nearness to you through your remembrance So it's through remembrance that you can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala In du'a kumail we also say ya man ismuhu dawa'un wa dhikruhu shifa'un If remembrance of Allah is healing So then what is the illness <clears throat> forgetfulness if we forget allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then this is the illness if you remember allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then this is shifa what is the medicine to use in order to be healed because there are two things one is shifa one is medicine that you use dawa ya man ismuhu dawaun wa dhikruhu shifa names of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are like medicine but if you take them and absorb them then you have shifa but if you don't take them and just keep them on your lip you know someone has a tablet on his lip doesn't take it in he would not be cured if 1000 times you say you know ya allah ya allah but this is only on your lip doesn't have that much impact it's still it's good but not big impact if you know sometimes i think that you know why we are said you know to say 34 times allahu akbar 33 times alhamdulillah 33 subhanallah why because hopefully one of them goes inside <laughs> unfortunately we have learned how to keep all of them here you know like some children when they don't like you know tablet they keep it here and when you are not looking at them they throw it away so you have to take it in therefore we say ismuhu dawaun But dawa doesn't guarantee shifa. Dhikruhu shifaun. Remembrance is shifa. 
So, we need to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we have beautiful discussion in the Quran about tasbih. What is tasbih? Glorification of Allah. You know, I remember once I went to Pontifical Institute for Arabic and Islamic Studies in Vatican. This is year 2000. One of the things that, you know, drew my attention and I always remembered was I saw a booklet about 30, 40 pages on Allahu Akbar. It always remained in my mind, you know, in a Christian organization, they have produced a leaflet, 30, 40 pages on Allahu Akbar. And I had not seen something like that in, you know, the libraries that I have been to. So I always, you know, had this in my mind. And then Alhamdulillah, a few years later, I asked uh, one of the students in Qom to do her dissertation, one of the sisters in Jama on Tasbih. Alhamdulillah, about 300 pages produced on Tasbih. <clears throat> tasbih is very, very important. I have one lecture or two lectures on Tasbih on the internet, if you like. Tasbih is not just to say SubhanAllah. Tasbih is something that even Allah himself does. You know, when Allah says, Subhan alladhi asra ba'abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa, who is doing this tasbih? Even Allah is doing tasbih. Mu'mineen do tasbih. Angels do tasbih. Inhabitants of heaven do tasbih. So these are all different types of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't have time to go into uh, depths of the remembrance, but just a little bit because we have to cover many, many things. One of the things that you find in the handout is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبُ Verse 28 of chapter 13. Page two. The people who have faith and their hearts find serenity, tranquility, peace with remembrance of Allah. But then Allah says this is actually a general rule. It's not only some people who have this. The general rule is that it's only with remembrance of Allah that hearts can come at rest. Unless you turn your heart towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your heart has no rest. Sometimes we see the heart is disturbed, is stressful. We think maybe it's because I don't have enough money. If I have lots of money, my heart will have rest. So you have money, heart has no rest. Maybe if I marry, I will have rest. You marry, you have no rest. Maybe if I have children, I would have rest. No. Maybe if my children go to a school, to university, if they marry, nothing bring rest. Except connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are connected to Allah, whether you are hungry or poor, single or married, you would have sukun. Without that, there is no way to experience Sukun, because this is the nature of our heart. This is the way our heart is made. Our heart is made in the way that nothing can satisfy our heart except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, Allah has put such desire for infinite perfection, infinite beauty, infinite good in our heart. Okay? Our heart is made in the way that has desire for infinite, absolute perfection. Okay, when we have such a heart, 
then nothing can satisfy it because everything is not infinite. When you don't have it, you think it's infinite. Yeah? Someone who doesn't have any money, he thinks money is infinite and absolute perfection. If you become rich, then you have everything. But you see, no, money. Someone who is not married and loves a girl or boy, they oh, that's perfection. If I marry, you know, my soul would come at rest, you know, it's making my life, you know, perfect. After you marry, you see, not substantial change has happened. I remember, you know, when we were doing our PhD, it was a bit stressful because we were, you know, a stranger in a sense, Karib in UK. And, you know, we had limited scholarship and sometimes, you know, up to the last day, you don't know whether you can finish or not, because especially in the UK, you don't take any course. Everything is based on your thesis. And up to the oral exam day, you don't know because you don't have any ex uh, credit, anything, you know, just it depends on the day of exam. So it's a bit stressful. So many of us thought that if a day comes that I finish my PhD, then, you know, I would be just flying in the sky, you know, no stress, you know, I can go back home with my family, with success, you know. But, you know, the same day that PhD finished, nothing happened. <laughs> you know, you were thinking that, you know, tons of weight will be removed from you. Because really, those weight was there, you know, you could feel it. But it's amazing, when it finished, nothing changed. There was weight, but lift of that weight didn't make you feel rest. Because there are so many other things which are there that just they keep changing. Like, you know, if you have few children and one of them comes on your shoulder, he goes away, another one comes. So, Never your shoulder is free. So Allah has made us in this way that nothing will satisfy us except being connected to him. So if you want to try it, you can try it. But there is no need to try it. But you can try it. Try money. Try anything. Fame, position. Expose it to your heart. You see after some time your heart says, no, I want more. Even if you give someone control over the whole country, he says, I want neighboring countries. If you give neighboring countries, I want the whole continent. Say, whole continent for you, no, I have the, want the whole world. And you say, whole world for you, say, no, I want other planets. No way to be satisfied because there is a desire in us for perfection. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'innul qulub. It's only with the remembrance of Allah, real remembrance of Allah, that heart comes at rest. Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam says in Nahjul Balagha that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ja'ala dhikra jala'an lil qulub. You know, our heart sometimes gets uh, dusted, polluted. To polish the heart, you need remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, you know, when something is being frozen, you have to bring it close to the light, to the sun, so that gradually it becomes again normal. So, remembrance of Allah. Another thing is worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran tells us that He has created jinns and ends, human beings, in order to worship Him or maybe more precisely to serve Him. ما خلقت الجن والإنس إلا ليعبدون ما أريد منهم من رزق وما أريد أن يطعمون Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says I don't want from them any رزق 
any sustenance. I don't want them to feed me. I created them in order to grow, in order to develop. And the only way for us to develop is when we serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no way for us not to serve. If someone thinks that we can, you know, be not serving, we can be Lord, it's impossible. We cannot be Lord because we are fully dependent. We are needy. As philosophers say, we are munkin al wujud. We are contingent. We have to be connected. We have to serve. Those who try to serve themselves, they make mistake. Some people say, let's serve ourselves. Let's worship ourselves. It's easier. Then we don't need to go to masjid. I worship myself. So wherever I am, I can worship. But this is not helping. The only one whose servitude gives us honor is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-ubudiyyatu jawharatun kunhuha rububiyya. Servitude to Allah is something that its core, its substance is lordship. You can serve yourself. You can serve the king. You can serve the king of the kings. Which one is better? If I serve myself, nothing happens. If I serve the king, at least king supports me. But how much king can support me? Very limited. Can he save me from death? Can he save me after he dies? Can he save me when other people attack him? So it's better to serve king of the kings. We say in dua, Elahi, kafa bi izzan an akuna laka abda. If we really understand even this one sentence, if we really absorb it, it's enough. If we realize that our honor is to be abd for Allah, to be servant of Allah, and our fakhr, our pride is that He is our Lord. So, worship is important, but worship sometimes can become just physical. You know, we have worshippers, we have Abed who worships, but we have Abd. Which one is more important, Abed or Abd? Abd is more important. What is the difference between Abed and Abd? How do you differentiate between Abed and Abd? Okay, so what do they differ? Constantly worshipping? How? Yeah. You know, Abed is the one who does certain actions for his ma'bud, for the one that he worships. Yeah, Abed does some actions. For example, praise, fast. Yeah. But Abd is different. Abd lives for his master. His life is for master. When you are abd, even if you are sitting, you are abd. If you are sleeping, you are abd. If you are ill in bed, you are abd. But if you are abed, just when you are doing ibadah, you are abed. When you stop doing ibadah, you are not abed. So the, these are two different types of relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes I say, Abid works part-time. He says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, actually most of us are just like this. We say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh Allah, every day is 24 hours. What do you want from me? 
Five times a prayer. Okay, 15 minutes I am at your service. This month of Ramadan I have to fast. Okay, from this time to this time I fast. But don't, you know, ask me not to go to office, not to do other things. I want to do everything as I wish. Just tell me how much you want from me. So it's minimal. You try to do something for Allah and keep rest of your life free for yourself. I plan for myself. Just make sure that that minimum is kept. This is Abed. Who is Abd? Abd is constantly at the service of Master, Mola. He says, I want to live for you. In the salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alam. It's not that only my salat is for Allah, my fast is for Allah, my life is for Allah. And when your life is for Allah, your death is also for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then you are 24 7. Abd is full time, not only full time in the sense of 40 hours per week. Full time is day and night, weekday and weekend, is Abd. And therefore the relation of Abd and Mawla is different. Abd needs to eat. Then he can say to Allah, I am your Abd. For serving you I need to eat. So even eating becomes part of his obudiyah. I have to drink, I have to rest. I have to look after my family, but because of you. So everything that Abd does is counted. If Abd is ill for a few days, few weeks, few months, it still is Abd. But Abed, if he doesn't work, he's not paid. Because Abed, he chose that I work for, for you and send you the invoice. 70 rakah prayer, pay me for this. Fasting, pay me for this. This is the relation that we have with Allah. I want to give charity first. Let me calculate, you know, how much Allah gives me for this pound that I'm spending. This is the relation of Abed. So Abed is indeed a business person. He calculates how much he can get more from the pocket of Allah. But Abd <coughs> says, I don't want money. It's your responsibility. I am your servant. You want your servant to come to the street, to the society with prestige or without prestige. It's your responsibility. You want me to be rich or poor, it's up to you. You want me ill or healthy, it's up to you. I am your servant. Let me just think about what I can do for you and I leave everything to you. Then so these people have another relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't know if you have heard the story of uh, Ayaz and King Mahmud, Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi. So this Ayaz is very famous in literature. Many times they mention him. He was very much loved by the king. Because king saw in him sincerity, so that he really wants to help him, serve him. But some people were jealous. So they kept telling the king, he is not honest, he is not a good person. So one day king wanted to test them. So when they were maybe out, you know, in somewhere in the forest, whatever, he had some jewelries, some coins in his hand and dropped them as if it happened, you know, by accident. But when it dropped, he said, everyone, whatever he takes is for him. So you can collect it and will be for you. And when they dropped, you know, they were all over the floor. So these wazirs and other people, you know, advisors, all these people, 
went everywhere to find this because it was valuable. Ayaz didn't move. He stayed next to the king. Those people after collected whatever they could, they came and when they saw Ayaz has not moved, they tried to use this as a kind of opportunity. So they said to the king, look how arrogant he is. He didn't want to bend down and collect these jewelries that are from you. He is very arrogant. We are humble. We love you. We went to collect this. Then the king said, let's ask him. Oh, Ayaz, why you didn't go to collect these things? He said, I have you with me. Why I should go for jewelries? I thought it's better if I remain with you than going to collect these jewelries. Then the king said, look, this is difference between him and you. You want me for my money. But he wants me for myself. There is another story that they told the king, Ayaz does something strange. Every day he goes to a room and locks him inside the room, doesn't let anyone to go to that room, remains there for some while. We don't know what he's doing. Maybe he's planning something. Maybe he's connected with terrorism. <laughs> You know, two days everyone you know is easily accused so king said let's go and surprise him when he is there see what he's doing so he and people went and they knocked the door and ayaz was you know shocked so they said we want to come and see he said no there is nothing important i said no we want to come so they saw ayaz has a simple room and has put very old and torn out dress on the wall and just sitting and looking at it. So what do you do? He said, every day I come here, I look at this dress and said, this is your dress when you were not servant of the king. Don't forget that. Whatever you have is from the king. Don't think, you know, this dress of honor that you have is from you. This is what you had yourself. So the king loved him even more. So the enemies cannot do anything when someone is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Abd is very much different from Abd. In the months of Ramadan, I think Allah gives us a special treatment. In the months of Ramadan, Allah treats us like true servants. And this is why he say, no mukum fihe abad. In the months of Ramadan, when you sleep, is abad. It doesn't say a sleeping during the day, even a sleep during the night is about that. And fa sukum fihe tasbih. Even when you breathe is tasbih. A'malukum fihe maqbul. All your actions are accepted. Du'aukum fihe mustajab. All your du'as are accepted. This is a special treatment in the months of Ramadan. But those who are servants of Allah, Throughout the year, their norm is abad. Their breathing is tasbih. Their du'as are accepted. Their a'mal are accepted. So this is a special offer for the months of Ramadan, but you can keep it throughout the year if you become the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one thing. The other thing is trust in God. Tawakkul. I want to expand a little bit on tawakkul. And many of you are teachers, so I hope this discussion, inshallah, would help you. There are few things that we can use them as some weapons, 
some instruments. It means that you can use them against shaitan. You can use them against ignorance, against problems. Okay? For example, dua. Ad dua o salahul mu'min. Dua is a weapon. You can use dua against the enemies, which is in the first place is shaitan, nafsa ammare, ignorance. Salat is another weapon or instrument. Not only because salat is dua, but also because Allah says, استعينوا بالصبر والصلاة. Whenever you need help, whenever you are faced with difficulties, pray to rak'ah, for rak'ah, especially your wajibat, and ask Allah for help. Istainu bisabre wassala. Sabr is patience. In some hadith, it is applied to fasting. If you have a big hajjah, fast and pray. These have power. Another thing which has great power is tawakkul. Sometimes, you know, it seems that we think tawakkul is just a formality. Just, you know, for the sake of being polite, we say tawakkal to Allah. I put my trust in God. We think it doesn't do anything. Just, you know, we have to say this because, you know, we are believers. So we say tawakkal to Allah. But this is not the case. Tawakkul is a great help. Is a great weapon against shaitan, against ignorance, against darkness, against nafsa ammare, against sins, tawakkul, against difficulties of life, challenges of life, is a great weapon. The one who does tawakkul and the one who doesn't do tawakkul, they have totally different situation. It's not a matter of formality. Imagine, for example, if you have an angel as your helper. It doesn't change your situation. It changes your situation. Tawakkul is not less than an angel. Tawakkul is a very big spiritual tool. So, in order to understand this issue better, I would like to mention one example for you. <coughs> You know the story of Abrahe and Abdul Muttalib. When Abrahe, out of jealousy, wanted to destroy Kaaba with a big army of elephants and you know many many soldiers, went to uh, destroy Kaaba. As you know, outside Mecca they stationed. They saw some of the camels of the people of Mecca outside because they used to keep, you know, as like, you know, farms, you know, they had their camels outside. So he confiscated the camels of Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib heard the news of Abrahe coming with a big army trying to destroy Kaaba. He also heard that he has confiscated his camels. He was also the patron of Kaaba. He was the one who had the keys. He was responsible for Kaaba. But he knew that there is no way for them to fight this army. This army was too big. They couldn't, you know, defend. So he decided to go and talk to Abraham with few of the youths and people, he went, and he was such a charismatic person that Abraham liked him. So he thought that he has come for negotiation. Maybe he wants to, you know, offer a deal, a peace, you know, treaty. But to his surprise, Abdul Muttalib told him, release my camels. He said, 
I thought such a person with such, you know, great, you know, personality has come to ask me not to attack Kaaba. You just are asking about camels? He said, Ana Rabbul Ibili Walil Bayt Rabbun. I am the Lord of the camels. I am responsible for my animals. This house has its own Lord. And you know what happened to Abraham? Now my question is this. Up to here is famous, everyone knows. But I think we didn't reflect enough on this story. Why Abraham was destroyed? Why Allah protected Kaaba? At that time, but throughout the history, many times Kaaba was destroyed. If Allah is the Lord of the house, why He sometimes defends the house and sometimes doesn't defend the house? My answer is this if the one who is responsible for taking care of house puts his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will protect the house. If he says, you know, I know how to protect this house, then Allah says, okay, go and protect. Then you see they cannot protect. So it is true that this house is the house of Allah and Allah is the Lord of this house, but it is tawakkul of Abdul Muttalib that can release this energy which is in tawakkul. And that energy can defeat Abraham with all his soldiers and elephants. Tawakkul. How much tawakkul has power? How much dua has power? How much salat has power? If someone asks you, how much power is there? The answer is, it depends on the power of your soul. Because these are spiritual tools. These are not physical tools. If someone has a gun, how much the bullet can reach? It depends on the gun. It doesn't depend on the one who is holding the gun. Whether a person who is masterful or a person who is naive, this gun cannot shoot more than this. One kilometer, ten kilometer, whatever it is, it's fixed for everyone. How much this car can go? 200 kilogram per hour, 250. Anyways, the same for everyone. But how much tawakkul can work? How much dua can work? How much salat can work? It's not fixed. It depends on the one who prays, on the one who does tawakkul, on the one who does tawassul. One person can do tawakkul and even one mosquito doesn't move. One person can do tawakkul and all these ababil come and destroy Abraham. We can do dua and nothing happens. Ibrahim ala nabiyyina wa alihi wa alihi salam hundreds of years before Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he did everything. He said to Allah, Rabbana wab'ath fihim rasoolan min anfusihim yatlu alayhim ayatik wa yu'allimuhum al-kitab wa al-hikma with Ibrahim several centuries before asked Allah for the coming of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at the power of dua of Ibrahim and Allah exactly answered his dua. لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعْثَ فِيهِمْ It means لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ بِالدُّعَاءِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ إِذْ بَعْثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ So dua 
can reach people who come after several centuries. It is dua of Ibrahim and Ismail when they said, وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتَنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكْ They prayed for a nation who would be submissive to Allah, Muslim, in their progeny. So, salat, dua, tawakkul are treasures, are spiritual tools that depending on your soul's capacity, you can benefit from them. The more you grow, the more you can benefit from them. Never underestimate tawakkul. Never underestimate dua. Whatever you want, you can achieve. Just change yourself. The problem is not in dua. The problem is in us. The problem is not in tawakkul. The problem is in us. We have to really appreciate these uh, spiritual tools and use them. Okay, so this is about trust. Maybe we can have a short break and inshallah we continue. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alam.